The courts have found that dismissing an employee without a disciplinary hearing is fair. How is this possible? This is Stuff Employers Should Know. Welcome to Stuff Employers Should Know, proudly brought to you by LabourNet, management's ultimate HR solution. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Barry Gordon-Davis, and across from me, back from extended, long, festive year-end leave, is Yes, yes Like It Ismail. How are you doing, man? Hey, BGD. Welcome back. Um, the long, festive leave you were talking about was your own, right? Because uh, No, no. I, I like was I just busy telling you off air about me working all the way through. So it was just waiting for you to come back so that we can do our first podcast oh, for 2023. So... Can you believe it? It's funny that there's a whole lot of dust in your mic and not mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, when I'm in studio, hey. But um, today's episode, we are going to be discussing the possibility of uh, disposing of pre-dismissal procedures. So in terms of the Labor Relations Act, specifically Schedule 8, Code of Good Practice for Dismissals, you know, it always states that before a employee is terminated, whether it is for conduct, capacity, or even operational requirements, that they need to be given a fair opportunity to state their case. This basically is done in the form of a disciplinary hearing, a counseling session, or consulting, and the like. Um, and the, the, the possibilities of an employer terminating an employee for valid reasons, however, without going through the proper pre-dismissal procedures and giving them a fair opportunity has the consequences of the CCMA or bargaining council finding that despite the fact a termination had substance or merit and fair reason to terminate, the fact that there was not a disciplinary hearing or fair procedure followed, the courts can actually go and find that the termination, despite it being substantively fair, was actually procedurally unfair. So you're telling me that if I catch you red-handed stealing our equipment, I've got camera footage, um, and I come to you and be like, And I even admit to it. You even admit to it. Mm. I come and show you the footage, you've admitted to it, I say, okay, cheers, you're fired, goodbye. Yeah. That can be seen as an unfair dismissal. I call this the Gordon Ramsay moments, you know, Hell's Kitchen, get out of my kitchen type of thing, heat of the moment. And no, that's not what I'm actually referring to, because under those circumstances, that would not be exceptional. Um, Under those circumstances, acting in heat of the moment, you can't then go and say, oh, well, you know, I was hot under the collar. I was acting like Gordon Ramsay. I chased the person out of my kitchen and I told them. Because under those circumstances, the employees usually go and run off to a bargaining council or or CCMA, and I'll say, well, you know, despite the fact that my employer is saying, oh, no, it was just a heat of the moment thing, they, they technically fired me. However, the courts have realized under those circumstances that the employer should demonstrate immediately after such a situation how they attempted to right their wrong. So they realize the error in their ways. They realize that, you know, you can't just chase somebody away. Um, they, they have rights with regards to being, you know, found guilty through a valid process and procedure you basically say i realize the error in my way please come back retrospective reinstatement if that's actually involved or it was a heat of the moment heat of the in the kitchen Um, come back we have to then give you a fair opportunity Um, that's not what i'm actually referring to i'm referring to three specific situations specifically where there is a potential of the uh, well the employee goes and refuses or refuses or fails to participate in the proceedings, or maybe even fails to attend the disciplinary inquiry. And then probably the, 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 one of the more interesting ones is where there's effectively an exceptional circumstance in terms of a crisis um, or a protection of life and property. Now, if we go and we go, uh, talk about that Gordon Ramsay moment that we've been discussing as well, the, the employee didn't willingly um, refuse to participate in proceedings. So when we talk about a refusal or failure to participate in proceedings or to state their case, um, whether it's and, – and that can be quite general. Either they actually don't pitch for the disciplinary inquiry at all or they actually – just choose not to participate in the proceedings by means of, let's say, disrupting them or um, refusing or remaining silent or not participating from those grounds. 
Now, that would be then seen as them effectively waiving their right. They waive their right to um, participate in the proceedings. And under those circumstances, the chairperson involved will go and say, well, look, you are not proceeding or you're disrupting these proceedings. I'm warning you that if you continue with this behavior, we're going to then continue in your absence. And under those circumstances, it can be found that it was the employee willfully disrupting the proceedings. The same goes with absence. So if an employee is absent from the disciplinary inquiry, before we just go on assuming that there's a willful refusal to participate, there should be further investigation, either by the company or the chairperson that's been appointed, to see is there a willful refusal to participate or not to attend? Are they dispensing of their rights by choosing not to attend? And that is a... Obviously, an exploratory or investigatory process where if they can show on a balance of probabilities or good cause that the employee by their own uh, choice or will or um, omission even is intending to not participate in these processes, they then can be seen to have um, dispensed of their rights and the employer can then go on and terminate the employee without them being present or in absentia or without going on with the process and the procedure. So uh, of a case that happened with uh, MAPEPA uh, versus South African Weather Service in 2010, the employee was dismissed in absentia on charges of gross negligence, dereliction of duties, breaching uh, procurement policies. The employee declined to attend the disciplinary inquiry because he believed that he would be unfairly treated. So he preempted that he was going to be unfairly treated, yet presented no evidence or basis for this claim. So the the chairperson and the initiator were external parties, and they were there to ensure fairness and the commissioner that then presided over the subsequent referral to the CCMA said that, you know, it's futile, that there, you know, there was no way of knowing if the employee would ever agree to attend the hearing because of the submissions that were being made and the, the, the intent to refuse under those grounds. Um, and in those circumstances, it was found that the employer was entitled to decide the matter without hearing the employee's side, and there was thus no procedural unfairness. So to reiterate, what has to be present in order to continue without their involvement in the, the procedures is a willfulness from their side. If they are absent and it turns out that they are, let's say, uh, detained by police or they provide a valid sick note, those would not be valid grounds for the employer to then continue with those proceedings in their absence. So um, that, that then obviously covers, um, you know, the disruption, willful disruption, uh, refusing to participate or absentia of the accused party. Barry, you mentioned that the employee said that he refused to or rather didn't want to attend the hearing because he preempted that he'd be treated unfairly. Um, how would it ever be possible to actually prove that you would be treated unfairly in the future? Yeah, um, I mean, how, would there have been a better way for him to approach yeah, it's that? A, it's, a, it's a common error that occurs where there's this... Um, uh, presumption that they that a party is going to be unfairly treated. I mean, this happens through all dispute resolution processes. You know, sometimes at the CCMA, we've seen commissioners get bombarded with you going to be biased. And it's extremely difficult to prove that prior to a matter actually occurring. So what the employee should have actually done in these processes is participated in the proceedings, gone through the procedures that were done by the employer, and if there was then any evidence as a result thereof that indicated bias or unfairness, participating in the process and then identifying those areas would have given them more chance of challenging the fairness of their dismissal. So you walk out, how do you then say it was unfair if you weren't party to the process? Um, so the best way to do it is to actually give the employer an opportunity to um, follow their rules and procedures and only if it is then blatantly um, evident thereafter where you then can present whether it's tangible or intangible those evidence would have to be it would have to present itself that a commissioner may find that there was actually a presence of unfairness in fact that's where the commissioners are tasked as part of their um, duties and roles where a dismissal is disputed on the grounds of substance and procedure the commissioners themselves are there to actually determine and there's an onus on proof 
on the employer to prove that the dismissal was actually procedurally fair. So the commissioners are there to actually go and have a look and see if the employer has dotted their I's and crossed their T's, which is why it's imperative that employers in any uh, pre-dismissal procedures ensures and turns up the dial to 11 that they follow their processes and procedures to the T and give everybody in a fair and equal opportunity to state their case, not to mention the other rights such as witnesses and the likes, which we've discussed in many podcasts. So and that's why it's always important for employers to try and not attempt to do these things themselves, but to get professionals in legal representative uh, consultants, um, labor net to assist them in that regard. Bias intended. Barry, we've spoken about attempting to follow procedure, but can an employer terminate an employee without any sort of procedure or hearing? Yes, so and, and that's probably the, the the crux of the question that we asked at the start of the podcast. Um, and that is where, and, and it has very many forms, but where there is a possibility of, uh, and we refer to them as crisis zone cases, but it's instances where an employer has to act immediately to protect life and property. Um, these are very um, exceptional circumstances, and under those circumstances is where the employer then dispenses with even an attempt to follow the procedure because it might have the negative effect to property and life in particular. Um, for example, if an employee is being charged with, let's say, assault um, and brandishing a dangerous weapon, and through the entire process and investigation, they threatening to, let's say, kill other employees or harm other employees or like, it would be a bit untoward to then invite them to a, a disciplinary hear, hearing and have them then, you know, present and cross-question into the parties that they threaten in their lives to. I mean, obviously, the, there's criminal elements involved with that too. However, the employer would, you know, has an onus to ensure the safety of their staff. and as well as a right to ensure the safety of their property. And under circumstances, and that's one example, um, you know, it, it would be untoward for him to be expecting of an employer. And the employer would have to go and demonstrate that exceptional circumstance. Go and say, that, you know, I had this employee threatening to, to, to assault people or to harm them. Um, they were brandishing a weapon. Maybe they have a, uh, they're refusing to, re um, let's say, give up their firearm at the entrance of the company and they want this firearm with them. And we say, look, no weapons on property, and they they refusing to do so un, unreasonably. Um, you know, why would we then want to then go and say, okay, cool, well, we can have a hearing in that regard? Now, another one that obviously occurs as well is specifically with um, let's say unprotected strike action, where there's this obviously heated scenario uh, where there's a wildcat strike and employees have acted on a whim and down tools but you know it's 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 common that a strike where strike is just the refusal to work um, there's this unfortunate scenario specifically in South Africa that strikes specifically unprotected strikes or wildcat strikes are supported by acts of violence and the, and the sort and you know it's it can then spread and in a if you have a look at case law with regards to 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 this matter, um, there's actually a case of Lefu and others versus Western Areas Gold Mining, leading all the way back. I don't even know if you had been born yet, yes, sir, but um, 1985 in the industrial court, where 205 employees were summarily dismissed without a hearing. And they had caused a riot, effectively. Um, nine miners had been killed. And the courts found that in those circumstances, it's a great example of exceptional circumstances because – and they allowed the employer to depart from the general rules of ha giving them an opportunity to state their case and have pre-dismissal uh, proceedings because they basically felt that you know, dismissing the 205 employees um, out of 14,000 employees – have it may have eliminated you know fresh unrest um, and the approach was justified under those circumstances so almost seeing it as the greater good overrides things and you know the potential unrest and harm that could have been caused to life and property further um, uh, was then alleviated by dispensing with the procedures so 
remember, the excuse of crisis zone situations will only be accepted by the CCMA when they have truly exceptional circumstances. We can't just go and say, oh, I'm intimidated. Uh, I'm, f- I'm fearful to testify. I'm fearful of my life. There has to be something that has to be supporting that, that, that position. And the employer will always bear the onus to show though that those crisis situations existed. Um, so it ha- essentially has to be proven by the employer that they had no other choice but to dismiss employee or employees without a process. So being called an idiot sandwich won't be seen as a crisis, right? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> so that concludes our first episode of 2023 stuff employers should know if you want to get in touch suggest topics or even just say hi you can fire off an email without following any procedure at all to sesk at labornet.com or find us on all major social media platforms don't forget to subscribe to the podcast or whichever platform you use so that you can never miss out on an episode and ensure that you stay in the know of all things labor law this year Um, We've got a lot of exciting things coming up, a lot of new segments that we're going to be introducing to the show. So I look forward to all of that. So from me, BGD, and yes, till the next episode, cheers. Stuff Employers Should Know was proudly brought to you by LabourNet, management's ultimate HR solution. For more episodes from Stuff Employers Should Know, go to Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you play your favorite shows. Case law or statutes referenced in the podcast are current at the time of recording.